The other side of the road is safe, where we sidestep being bothered and avoid getting involved. But rolling up your sleeves and boldly going where few dare to tread, that's walking through Samaria. Each week on our podcast, we introduce you to the special few who walk in the spirit of the Good Samaritan. On behalf of The Giving Company and your hosts, David Hendrickson and Dan Riveros, welcome to the Walking Through Samaria podcast. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Walking Through Samaria podcast. This is your co-host, David Hendrickson, with Dan Riveros. And we have a very special guest for you today coming from... Well, maybe North Carolina, Edward. I don't know if you're in North Carolina today, but Edward Graham is here. Edward, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I I am. I'm in my hometown of Boone, North Carolina right now. Momentarily, I am here. Very good. Very good. Well, I'm sure you you travel a lot, even now in in COVID time. I'm sure our listeners recognize the last name, but I'm going to give a a brief bio of you here, and then we'll, we'll get into some other discussions about the great work being done at Samaritan's Purse. Edward Graham is the youngest son of Franklin and Jane Graham and the grandson of Billy Graham. He's serving as assistant to the vice president of programs and government relations for Samaritan's Purse. Edward graduated from the United States Military Academy, where he went on to serve 16 years in the U.S. Army. After multiple combat deployments within special operations and serving in various leadership positions, he felt called by the Lord to return home and serve in the ministry starting in the winter of 2018. Edward and Christy have been married for 14 years, have one daughter and three sons, They are raising their four children in the mountains of North Carolina. Edward, it's great to have you. Welcome, man. No, thanks. Appreciate you having me today. Look forward to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure our listeners are going to want to know, and you probably are tired of this this kind of question or dialogue, but can you give us a little bit of a picture of what it was like to grow up as the grandson of Billy Graham and the son of Franklin Graham? No, I get it asked often, and I'm okay with that. It comes with this big <laughs> nose, this big chin I sport, and I guess, and it looks a lot like his. But my, what you saw on TV with my grandfather is what you saw at home as well. There, mm. there wasn't two different Billy Grahams. My brothers and I and my cousins, we kind of say the same thing. We got to see the same individual that y'all did. Um, he was a very loving and a very gracious uh, grandfather, but you know I don't. I never talk about my grandfather without talking about my grandmother Ruth. We called her Tete. Yeah, she's old lady in Chinese. Uh-huh. You know, she was born in China, but there never would have been a Billy Graham had there not been a Ruth Graham, a Ruth Bell first. And mm. uh, so she was. We had a special connection. My grandmother and I did. I was very close with her. I spent a lot. Of, she was the one that was more readily accessible. Anyways, uh, you know, was home more often. Sure. Yeah. Um, but they were both very supportive of my career decision of going into the military. Mm. Um, big, both big prayer warriors uh, would pray with you. Um, but once I, I share this story often, my brother, you know, I observed this. My brother likes to repeat. I'd forgotten it until one time he told me. And um, But one day my grandfather was walking around the house, and he, he loves root beer. That was his favorite drink, to get <laughs> a root beer. He was coming back to get an A&W root beer. And as he came into the kitchen, he stopped and read a little bit of scripture of an open Bible there. And then he walked back down the hallway, and there's another open Bible back there, and he read a little bit of a different passage. Mm. And my brother Roy confronted him and goes, well, Daddy, we called him Daddy Bill. And I go, Daddy Bill, how how could you possibly have gotten some from that? You read for like 10 seconds. And he's like, I sip on the Word all day long. Mm. And he mm. took a sip of root beer and kept walking. And uh, <laughs> so I think that resonated with me, you know, s- sipping on the Word all day long. And everyone, yes, my grandfather was a student. He had a, a large portion of Scripture memorized. Wow. But him and my grandmother always studied it, whether they were together or alone, they studied the word. Mm. And that was the example they said. They believed every word of it to be God breathed, every word of it, and they accepted by faith that it was true. Yeah. And yet they, they continue to read it. So that mm. that's what it was like growing up under the mantle of building. It opened doors, you know. I saw some cool things, neat things. Yeah. And it closed the doors at the same time and there was expectations of us kids and you know, I think from the the worldview. But uh, at the end of the day, he was my grandfather, and he was a very loving grandfather. That's awesome. That's awesome. What a great, those are great stories, great, yeah. great memories, I'm sure. Yes. So you went to West Point, and that's like considered one of the best public schools in the country, right? Could you tell us about your experience yeah. there? West Point. Yeah, I mean, that's we, awesome. We, we like to think highly of ourselves there, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, I went to Liberty University for a year, but I'd always had a dream of going to the military academy, kind of going to West Point. Yeah. I had two posters on my wall growing up, an Army Ranger and a... West Point poster. But when I got older into high school, I realized I hated math and science. So why in the world would I go to an engineering school like West Point? 
Um, went to, I had a scholarship to go to Liberty, played soccer. And while I was there, I just realized I was probably meant for something else and I was missing out on an opportunity. I had gone up to visit. My dad spoke at West Point mm. and I had talked to one of my best friends on the wrestling team and going. So I went up to visit and I realized it's time for me to apply. So I, I went back, told Dr. Falwell, my soccer coach, I was leaving and I uh, applied, got in. I don't know how. I, like I said, I, I hated math and science, uh, but the Lord just opened those doors. And, you know, the military academy was. Um, I was not an academic powerhouse. Let's put it that way. I uh, <laughs> I had to work. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Liberty. Was, I went from being an academic All American to Liberty to being a uh, on academic probation. <laughs> um, but God used and shaped and molded me there. And it's also where, you know, I, I was a, I accepted Christ as a young child. My mother led me to Christ when I was, a, was about five years old. And you know, I in high school I developed my quiet times and and studying, and I got a very personal relationship with God, but. It didn't become my own faith until I went to West Point. I made a lot of mistakes my junior and uh, my sophomore and junior year at West Point. We call them our cow and yuck years there. Um, I, you know, I struggled and I made some bad decisions. But a friend of mine called me out. Uh, one of my prayer group friends and uh, that we had a freshman year, we hung out together. And my junior year, he came to me and just say, hey, "God spoke to me. He wants me to come talk to you about not living for the Lord." And that took some courage to come to Billy Graham's grandson. I think and do that, but. Those times, God used me to shape me and challenge me for what was coming in combat. So yeah. I have no regret going to West Point. I got a great, a great education, um, but at the same time, it's you know it's a, something that God used. I think more spiritual than He ever did academically, and He prepped me for challenge and hard, hardships that were coming. Mm. I really get to come. So that's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. I, I this is irrelevant, but I'll just throw it out, Dan. So I talked myself out of the Naval Academy. So, well, you wouldn't know one, no one wants to go there anyway. <laughs> and, and it was one of those things where I was like, I don't want to be an engineer. Now, I, I didn't get nominated by our representative. I was second on the list. So yeah. I, by, to, to say I turned it down is wrong because I, I may have never gotten in. But I had the same mindset you did, which is I don't want to be an engineer, and it's evidently a great engineering school. Well, they also have a history major, which is what I ended up majoring in in, at Indiana University. (laughs) So I I look back on that as kind of blowing it. (laughs) So I only liked history. History was my class I was good at, but I was like, well, I don't want to teach, and I don't want to write a book, and I thought that's what history majors do. Right. So, yes, they do have majors, but you at least have to minor in engineering. Oh, do you really? Oh, wow. Okay. I was a poly science, basically, a social major. And with a concentration of international law, and then I obviously had a minor in engineering. I picked something called systems, which is basically Excel, and uh, I was horrible at that. So, <laughs> or they did not make me do nuke or something like that. So we're we're all a safer world for me. Not there. You go. <laughs> we can sleep at night, right? That's right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about some of you, some of your tours. I mean, special operations. That's. That's pretty hardcore. Can can you yeah. maybe talk a little bit about those sixteen years and how did they shape your view of the world? How did they shape your view of our country's role in the world? Play that yeah. out for us a bit. Um, you know, so I was a cadet at West Point when nine eleven happened, and mm. uh, I was a junior my junior year, and I thought I'd missed the war. Um, you know, boy, was I wrong. Yeah. Um, but I remember, you know, sitting there in New York when the towers were hit the day before I'd been on I-95 going to the airport to pick up a friend. And I was, lo- I was stuck in traffic because that's what you do in New York and in New right, Jersey. Right. <laughs> and I looked over at the towers and I was staring at them. And then the next day they're gone. Oh my gosh. And I just remember the anger and then the frustration, but I was fortunate to be a member of the 75th Ranger Regiment, which is a small special operations that I, unit that I spent most of my time in. Most about 13 years, my 16 years was spent there. And um, I loved it. But that's a unit that got to do something specific about AQ, about uh, the terrorists that did it. We were one of the first units into Afghanistan. As a matter of fact, we were one of the few units that's still there. Mm. My friends are still serving there. Uh, yeah, there's two regiments in the military that have been continuously deployed since the war started. That's the 160th, the Special Operations Helicopter uh, Unit that we fly with, and then us. Um, and the battalions just rotate through. And I love the work that I was doing there. You know, they basically give you a list, and you go over there, and you hunt the bad guys um, between Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. And, you know, that's what God called me to. I have no doubt he uh, He shaped and molded me. Combat's not easy. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. horrible things that happen yeah. there. And, and, 
you know, some of the hardest jobs I've ever had to do was knock on the door one night to inform a mom and dad their their son's no longer coming home in a week. Right. Um, he was yeah. a week out. Um, you know, mm-hmm. sitting in a crater watching a helicopter fly away with one of your guys that had died, and you knew a mom and dad are about to get the worst possible news ever. But you also you're still on mission. You got to continue mission. Um, and, and the work you were doing there on, on that on that particular day and keep the guys focused. But I think, again, God had used some hardships earlier on as far as academic and my challenges there to have complete faith and trust in the Lord. I knew early on that there were things bigger than me that I was not in control of and I wasn't going to be able to do myself. I learned I had to learn how to surrender that. Mm. Um, and so at a young age, I learned to count on God. And so through combat, I believed in the power of prayer. And God protected me and my, my men and my team. Sure, bad things happened. But I saw many miracles as well. Yeah. And, you know, through yeah. my eight deployments that I can talk about, you know, at least that they happened, um, I had nothing but great memories, and I loved it. I loved almost every minute of my time in the middle. Sure, there's jobs I didn't really care for, some of the staff ones. Um, but my time of leading troops in combat is my highest honor. Mm-hmm. And I learned that I love this country. We're not perfect. But as you travel around this world and you see the freedoms that we enjoy, there is no other country like it. Mm. And uh, mm. I, I'm proud to have fought for it. I love the men and women I served alongside. You know, there's many people like-minded that were like me, and they're fortunately are still there fighting and serving this great nation. But we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be proud of. Yeah. Um, this stuff you hear in the news of recent, you know, we're, you know, we're a horrible country or we're a racist country. Yeah, I would tell you we're not perfect. But, man, do we have a lot to stand on and be proud of and try to fight to replicate in other areas. The other nations would be so happy or so proud or joyous just to, to have the same freedoms that we have. I cannot thank the Lord enough for letting me be born, be born in the USA. Yeah. And uh, um, and that basically all my deployments were American appreciation tours. You know, you go over there and you're just so thankful for the freedoms that we have and that we enjoy here. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, I mean, we can hear your, your passion and, and kind of love for the military. And like you said, combat and serving and leading men and women in, in, you know, in, in combat, in the military, but, there comes a time when you get a you get a nudge of of some sort, right? That maybe yeah. maybe you're supposed to supposed to join the family business. Yeah. <laughs> how well, did that, how I did that go down? Like <laughs> yeah, I avoided it like the plague. Oh, as a matter of fact, I was a uh, I was a baton executive officer at the 75th Ranger Regiment, and I was on vacation. I was up in Alaska. You know, Dad has a ministry up there for wounded. Uh, soldiers and uh, service members that he started for their spouses. It's an unbelievable marriage retreat, Mm. Christ-centered marriage retreat that we're seeing lives and marriages uh, saved and uh, also just claimed by the Lord. And I love it. And uh, he's committed to life, you know, with these guys, just not a one-time touch. We're committed to life with them. And I was up there visiting it. And I was stuck. Dad's a pilot, and he was flying me out to a location, and we're flying over some snow-capped mountains. He was like, he got kind of quiet, and I knew something was coming. And Dad goes, Edward, you know, I could use some help. I need your help. That's America first. Yeah. Are you tired of deploying? Are you tired of combat? And are you ready to get out? And I, I was like, I mean, instantly there was no thinking. There's so like, no, sir. I'm where God called me. Yeah. And I kind of looked out the window. I wasn't making eye contact with him. I was kind of angry that he had cornered me there in the plane, but. <laughs> I was like, Dad, you know, I'll pray about it, but I'm where God wants me. Well, I prayed about it. You know, I I prayed the the prayer from James or, you know, who will go? Here I am, Lord, send me. That's a dangerous prayer, and usually we use it for combat in the military, but that's not what that verse is about. Um, And I continued to pray. I had been the, what they call an aide-de-camp. I didn't want it. I thought aide-de-camps were nerds, and I had nothing in common with them. I was too busy fighting wars. Um, but I got asked to be an aide-de-camp to the commander of U.S. Army Special Operations, a three-star general, and I didn't want to be it. And I told the general that, and he just kind of laughed and asked when I could report. But the nice thing, he allowed me to see the kind of the umbrella, you know, what generals do. And that's all I, I, I thought I wanted to be a general. And I thought that was what you know, my career was being set up for, and the yeah. reason they made me the aide yeah. is my bosses believed in me, and they thought that was a possibility the general thought this was a possibility for me. And I was being groomed for command within the special operations. And that's all I ever wanted. It's what my wife wanted. I married an unbelievable woman. My wife, Christy, she's an army brat. And um, she was raised for this. God found the perfect bride for me. 
and she loved it. She loved the small unit, the cohesive unit, the family we had there. Her family's a, they're all in special operations with me, her two cousins, her two brothers. We all served together. Um, and then out of nowhere one night, I just I started hurting. And a family friend of mine approached me. He's a board member as well. You know, Dad never asked me again, but his proxy sure did. And uh, you know, a couple <laughs> board members of family. I was going to say, you're a you're asked. an Army Ranger, right? Couldn't you have jumped out of the plane <laughs> yeah. when he was cornering you That's there? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I had no parachute that day. I do like to jump out with a good parachute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I prayed about it, and all of a sudden, God started changing my heart. Mm. And uh, we were doing an exercise late one night, and this was probably about three years later. And Dad is in the summer. Dad was in Alaska again with this ministry, with the soldier ministry. And it was about two in the morning. I go out in the parking lot and I call him. I was like, Dad, let's finish the Alaska conversation. And we did. And at the end of that, Dad said, Edward, you're four years to retirement. You're at 16 years. Stay till retirement and then come. I was like, okay. I told my wife she's excited that at least we get to stay longer. Um, I, I couldn't sleep. So my brother Roy, he told me, he goes, you know, Edward, the disciples left their nets in the water and they followed Jesus. They didn't take the fish to market. They didn't say, hey, we can use this money for ministry or, right, hey, I can sell right. the fish and set my mom up. They didn't say goodbye to their mom. They followed Jesus. I was like, you're absolutely right, Roy. So, <laughs> as angry as I was, I called Dad. And I was like, Dad, I, I'm coming. I'm getting out. And usually it takes about a year, especially when you have that many years in, it takes a while to get out of the Army. Yeah. I was on the promotion right. list. I was on the command list. All these things were being set up. Matter of fact, I was, I, when I got out, I got out in four months, and it messed up. I got out so quick because Congress had already approved my promotion. Congress had to approve to allow me to get out. Mm. Um, so I had to get a special uh, a little thing to go through to allow me to get out at that time. Um, so this is not what I wanted. You know, selfishly and, and professionally as a military, this is not, that's not how you end a career. If you want to learn how to kill a career, I just set the perfect example. <laughs> um, but I'm... I had no regrets. Uh, I knew if I had a regret, it's that I could have spent four years watching my dad and learning from him, or I could have spent four years and retired as a Lieutenant Green, a battalion commander, you know, and what does that mean? Well, that meant I had fun, you know, and that yeah. didn't prep me for what's coming ahead. So God spoke to me, bottom line, I felt the calling, and that calling was, come serve your father, allow him to finish strong, mm. and help him transition Samaritan's purse to whoever he or she is ordained by God to take it, for, you know, for the next few years. Wow. Okay, so transitioning in, God's changed your heart to a new role. What what exactly is that role in Samaritan's Purse? <laughs> well, Dad's been good to me. He's the so the my father and some of the board members would like for me to uh, when well, my dad, if he ever does retire, <laughs> I don't know if that happens. <laughs> Grams don't seem to retire. We just seem to die. I guess uh, I'll uh, I will I will run Samaritan's Purse. Uh, so what dad has me here is I'm in a great transition plan where I'm spending about six months with each of our field VPs. So I first came here and I worked with our North American ministries that does disaster relief yeah. all over the U.S., tornadoes, hurricanes, home rebuilds, Alaska. Mm. Uh, and so I spent time with them. And then I did about eight months with Operation Christmas Child, where, you know, I, that ministry, when I came, when I was a kid, did about 7,000 shoeboxes that first time. You know, last year they did almost 11 million, about 10 and a half million shoeboxes globally. Wow. And to see wow. how God used that to share Christ and how many kids have come to Christ because of those gospel opportunities and to see the greatest journey, the discipleship program going on, four and a half million kids a year at the discipleship program, it is unbelievable. It is a juggernaut that God's using for his glory. Uh, so I did that, and now I'm with our international projects. Kenny, I was traveling in Africa and Bangladesh, got home and the country shut down a week later um, because of COVID. And then I've been here watching the team set up COVID hospitals around the country and our responses around the world. Um, unbelievable opportunity to see how God's using, you know, medicine and hospitals that he's entrusted us with and aircraft yeah. to get around the world during a pandemic to serve where other ministries have to shut down or where you can't go. We get the ability to go. And so what am I doing right now? My role is to learn yeah. and, to, and to kind of soak it all in. So I'm following that and watching my father and how he leads. We're different people. We have different styles, but I'm seeing how, you know, bottom line is dad doesn't know everything and he knows he doesn't. So he's brought talent in. We got talent at Samaritan's Purse that is rivals whatever saw in special operations. Wow. And it's unbelievable the men and women that God's brought to us and that are bold and will go out and serve in the name of Jesus. So did do you have to like resist the urge, Edward, to you know, kind of kick your dad 
you know, hey, dad, today may be the day you got to you got to turn it over. Drop any hints. Like, well, dad, you may not be here tomorrow. Are you sure that decision sets me up right? Uh, you know, I'm like, I don't be like, well, man, I can't wait till things change. Uh, uh-huh. No, he, dad's, dad's been great with me. And to be honest, better than I ever thought he, it would be. Um, he's been very patient and he gives me a pretty long rope and he hasn't really had to smack me yet. But there's times we disagree. But I told Dad up front, I was like, Dad, I won't disagree with you in, in public. I may push a conversation because I can, I can get away with things that maybe other VPs wouldn't. Um, but I don't disagree with them unless it's in private. And if it's more legal and ethical enough scripture, you know, which all falls under more legal and ethical anyways, um, I execute. If Dad, if Dad hears it, he hears me out, and sometimes he says, okay. But most of the time goes, Edward, this is where I want to go. And I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, you Dad's go. done this for a long time. Um, yeah. I got a lot to learn from him. And there's some, there was one of our guys, Brian Willis, who's been with dad almost since the beginning. And Brian says, you know, you always get mad at your dad and angry with decisions he comes out with. But at the end of the day, he smells like roses. Um, you know, the decisions work and God's blessed it. He, dad has an insight from the Lord. I'm not going to call the man a prophet, um, but the man has some insight that I, I sit back. I was like, how did he know that was coming? Yeah. Or how does he see that? And he's on it. And some of the things I don't see right now, but just like I do with scripture, I trust it all to be God. I trust that God is using my father and I'm going to go that direction. And, um, uh, and so that's my role is to sit back and uh, most of it's in awe, but, uh, the staff has been patient with my father's been patient with me and I'm sitting here learning. I'm not the fastest learner. We already talked about that at my times at West Point, but, um, they're being very gracious with me. Bottom that's line, awesome. the whole staff here. Good for you. I, cool. I like the humility very, very much. Well, Edward, this podcast is called Walking Through Samaria for a very specific yeah. reason that, that Dan and I are, are passionate about. We went to Ethiopia. We were talking about this earlier today. We went to Ethiopia together in, in 2018 with one of our, our ministry partners, and we saw Christians and Muslims getting together in, in what World Vision sponsors as an interfaith forum for, for child protection, elimination of childhood marriage. Uh, you know, trying to improve uh, improve the divorce rate, reduce the divorce rate, I guess that would be, and improve yeah. families and, and all those kinds of things. And it, it took me to Luke chapter 10 to really study the parable of the Good Samaritan and why I believe Jesus specifically made the hero of the story a Samaritan. And, yeah. and you know, geez, we're talking to Grams here, Dan, like this is getting <laughs> scary. This is getting scary, but yeah, but, make no assumptions about me. About <laughs> but at the, at the time, Jews and Samaritans were at odds religiously, right. culturally, socially, ethnically, politically. And, and so I, I, I got particularly interested in the story stories of Samaritan's Purse hospitals around COVID time, and you just, uh, you just referenced them. So one of, the, one of the things about Samaritan's Purse, and of course it's, it's woven in your name, but being a good Samaritan was where you put those hospitals. They were in really tough spots, if I understand correctly, in Italy and in New York City. At the time, the epicenters. And, and the then... World. Yeah, why don't you talk about that for a second, and then we'll get into some of the other Good Samaritan activity in New York. Well, I pre- you know, as you say in our name, we're going to go to those places where you're not expected to or other people wouldn't go. Just like the, you know, the yep. Jewish leaders of the time passed, passed by that man on the road, it was someone you didn't expect to come and serve in an area that you don't expect them to be there. And so Dad's thing is we go to where the sounds of the gun are. He says the fire. I'm a military guy, so we go where, not where the fire is, but where the sounds of the guns are coming mm, from. Yeah. And Dad yeah. wants to be the not just necessarily the first ones there, but he wants us to respond in time where the, the leaders there, the community leaders are like, oh, wow, because they're still overwhelmed. Thank you for being here. So as we're sitting there and we're looking at the virus spread, you know, we talked about West Point. I'm a horrible engineer, but I learned – to appreciate a good bar graph, the bell curve, what that means. And as I'm looking at the numbers, I'm like, Dad, Italy here in about another week is going to be on fire with this virus, and it's going to be overwhelmed. Dad was, you know, we talked about him being a pilot. He was off at training it during this time for an aircraft. And we're talking back and forth on the phone, and I'm only getting him at night because he's in school all day, and I'm talking to him, and I'm trying to present. Dad's a visual guy, so i got to put stuff in front of him. I, I don't know. Yeah. He, it's not that he's sitting there with an iPad, but I'm sitting there talking to him about these numbers. 
And he's like, Edward, they got it's a Western country. They got hospitals. I was like, Dad, they're going they're going to be overwhelmed. This is the place to go. And so he's like, All right, we'll reach out. Well, who would have thought, you know, in a heavily Catholic country, they'd be allowing Samaritan's Purse to show up with a Christian hospital? We're not going to hide who we are when we're serving there. Right. But there we are, yeah. Cremona, Northern Italy. Uh, we we land there, and the country welcomes us with open arms. Mm. Um, matter of fact, the commander of U.S. Navy Europe in Africa, four-star admiral, calls me and goes, Edward, I can't believe it. You're the only thing flying over the ocean. We sent two <laughs> 17 cargo planes empty to pick up tissue samples for testing back to the CDC. They didn't, the U.S. military didn't bring supplies over for their NATO partners. We're the only thing they could hang their hat on. Wow. And he loved it um, and it was so appreciative. But he helped us out, too, with you know getting us to land at a NATO airport where we could safeguard our crews so they could fly back so we didn't have to isolate them when we came home, quarantine right. them, yep. because we had to send a second plane back over there. We have our own DC-8 cargo plane, but it still takes multiple trips. Uh, it's a huge aircraft, but, you know, a hospital takes up a lot of room. Yeah. Um, but we have what we call this DART team, this disaster assistant response team of volunteers and staff, of medical staff that come from all over the country and the world, for that matter, and responded to Italy. Um, but we saw, we sent our chaplains from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association as well. They train local chaplains. So when people make decisions for Christ, you know, we're making sure that a church there is loving on them and continue to disciple them because we are not the church and we're going to leave at one point. But Mm -hmm. the neat thing about Cremona at that time, if anyone was in the ICU being committed to the, the ICU there at their hospital, they were dying. That's how bad the virus was. And I don't know what was different about the virus in New York City and Italy, but people were dying at heavier rates there. And yeah. none of us survived in the ICU. When we showed up, we got to be a part of a miracle, and people started living in our mm-hmm. hospital. Mm-hmm. And uh, what a miracle to be a part of that. And we watched Decisions for Christ, another miracle. Yeah. Uh, you know, two weeks later, I'm sitting there. I was on a phone call with the, the president and the vice president for a commission, and they asked us, what could we do? And I told him we have one more hospital remaining. We had two hospitals at that time. We have one more, and if needed, we can we can go anywhere in the country where the federal government, state government go. Now, we have to be there invited by a governor because he has to – this is the U.S., so we just can't practice here. We have to get you know state exemptions for out-of-state doctors and nurses to practice there. So you need the state to approve it. Um the vice president's team called and goes, what about New York City? And we'd like, well, we'd love to, but, you know, personally, well, good luck getting that approval. Um, <laughs> within, But within two days, then invitation comes for the government. And when we go, well, where do you want us? They said Central Park. Wow. And like, well, you got to be kidding wow. me. But uh, the hospital there that we partnered with, Mount Sinai, was an unbelievable partner. Now, we have to have a partner here in the U.S. because of pharmaceuticals. Overseas, it's easy. We have our own drugs and stuff that we can use. But you can here, dispense. you yeah. have to use U.S. approved drugs. So we have to go through the hospital system for that. And they were a great partner hospital. But we, they decide who we see. They give us, a, they, they run through the normal channels, and it was, you know, Patients from all over the city came there, and they were like, hey, you take these patients. So it's not like we went through, because there was rumors coming out that we weren't helping uh, homosexuals. Right. Well, that, that's the biggest lie ever. I mean, we served whoever that hospital gave to us, and it's not like a questionnaire comes out, are you gay? Oh, you are? Well, we don't see you. No. Are you sick? Okay, then come here. Like, yes, let's let's care for you and love for you. So we got investigated there. Um by the 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 mayor's office mm. is this true mm. absolutely not true and the guy that investigates was a homosexual um and he said thank you for being here and loving our city now that was a small percentage of the people there in new york like less than one percent were grumbling the rest of the city couldn't it's what i remembered after 9 11 couldn't have been more loving, more yeah. gracious, more yeah. supportive, coming yeah. out of the woodworks to help volunteer and set up the field hospital. The New Yorkers, as always, they came out in force and came out in support and loved on their neighbors. And we had a great opportunity, unbelievable opportunity to once again love on everybody, share, use medicine as a magnet for the gospel, as a platform to be able to share our witness. Why are you here? Well, this is why we're here. It's not that we're sitting there. We, 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 we prayed with everybody. We loved on everyone. Um, but if given the opportunity about where does your hope come from, boom, right there, we get to share the hope of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's such a great, it's such a great picture. And I want to, I want to support what you just said, because I did a little research here. According to the New York Times, 
The city's Commission on Human Rights closed an investigation into the hospital after finding no evidence it had discriminated against patients, according to its press secretary, Alicia McCauley. And I, 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 I love what you said. It's sort of a great picture of the gospel, which is the question is, are you sick? Yeah. You know, that's it. And, and I'm, I'm just really pleased to see the example of a company called Samaritan's Purse being a good Samaritan in a place like Central Park in New York City, serving anyone and everyone who is sick. Yeah. And that's, you look at it and I'm like, all right, we were talking business. What a horrible business model if you were to reject the sick people. Um, but we're, it's just like the church. The church is not a refuge for Christians. It's a hospital. Yeah, you know, you're there for it. all the broken and the hurting. And so I, we want the homosexual community there. We want the downtrodden. You know, when we say sick, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about of the heart. And uh, that's exactly the people I want to be around and love with, just like Jesus was with the tax collector. I was reading the other night with my kids for devotions, for or evening devotions, and we're talking about Zacchaeus. And, you know, and that's exactly who God came to this earth for. And so, you know, for the New Yorkers and the people there in town, we couldn't have had a better visit mm-hmm. and a better opportunity to serve. Um, you know, we we still have hospitals available, man. You're the well. This is the first time we're talking about it probably, but we're deploying this week to the Bahamas with a hospital. Oh, wow. uh, another one's going oh, out. Wow. The, the uh, Nassau's overwhelmed, and we're oh, sending wow. our DCA oh, down wow. there. Um, we're in talks with other countries right now with our other remaining hospital that we have um, and about where to go. So we're still deploying. Um, and we're still going to go where the need is, but in all that we do and everywhere we go, we're going to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're there. So that's yeah, awesome. get, growing much bigger than New York. I see that you guys donated 55,000 masks to North Carolina hospitals. Yep. Also your field offices who have all adjusted or added new responses as a result of COVID food distribution for families with lost income, training healthcare professionals, ineffective, in, ineffective infection prevention and control measures. Like where does, where does it, stop you know how, how big yeah. is this reach truly well that so we have you know we're in a lot of countries but we have what we call country offices and seven uh field offices in 17 different countries mm. um mm. and so our challenge was to them your countries may be locking down like vietnam for one for example colombia but the need's still there and it's going to be greater than ever are we going to be loving on our neighbors there and they're going to know hey samaritan's purse was with us when everything else shut down so we kind of revamped some of our projects that were going on there for COVID specific and Colombia, for example. So we're there on the border helping with feeding programs and dealing with the Venezuela crisis and the refugees coming across. So we have reception and feeding centers and food programs going in. Well, none of that turned off, but then we're using our hospitals and our clinics that we have there to go around and do testing and education and training there for COVID. So that, so people in churches wouldn't live in fear during this, but would be armed and equipped with knowledge. Yeah. And then how to live their lives. And that's kind of where we revamped. And so none of our ministry opportunities have shut down. There might have been things, uh, food programs or water programs that we've had established that have to be put on hold because the government has shut down contracts or, you know, access. But there's still plenty of work to do right now with COVID. And that's why we're not turning on. Same thing with Operation Christmas Child. Some things might have been shut down in, in ports, but the churches weren't turned off. And they're wanting to get out there, and this is the time you want to share the hope of Jesus Christ, right, uh, right. especially the children. And so a lot of those countries are being turned back on you know, at, at the political level, um, but our team's never turned off. And they've been going out and working and finding ways with legally within the rules to be able to gather or to do their work. I couldn't be more proud of the staff and our volunteers out there. But like you said, Sudan, we were there at the request of the Sudanese government, um, and we've been there. They initially wanted a hospital. Just the numbers weren't there because they don't have testing. And so they don't quite know what they were. But we could tell their hospitals weren't quite overwhelmed yet. But we went there and we trained them how to do the wash site. So meaning we treat it just like we we learned our lessons and cut our teeth with Ebola. And, you know, we did have Dr. Brantley. Uh, he was that doctor that we brought here, the first U.S. patient that came back to the U.S. with it. That was a Samaritan's first doctor. But no one out, none of the other staff got That's sick amazing. Wow. during that whole time yeah. um, because of how we do our, our wash sites and how we go into the, the hospital and how we come out of it. So we treated our hospitals that we set up just the same way. So we're teaching other countries and even hospitals here in the U.S. the same thing with that. We went out and responded to the Navajo and their crisis because they were getting overwhelmed. 
Um, but we went out there and trained their doctors and nurses on how to do it. And we ran one of their hospital wards for them um, for that very reason, because they were getting overwhelmed. So God has entrusted us with the resources, this bottom line. His expectation is that we use them. Yeah. We don't hide. Yeah. We don't turn things <laughs> off. So woe to us if we sat on that capability during this time. So I'm thankful, though, yes, God gave us his resources, but he also gave us the people that aren't afraid, and they're going out there in the same time. So I, it's an exciting time for me to be here and be watching this. Man, any any this is probably an unfair question, but can you give our listeners a sense as to kind of the COVID situation right now? Is yeah. it getting better? It is, is it like, where are we at? No, I mean, me personally, as you look at it, again, I'm a numbers guy, and I'm a dangerous engineer, but I'm looking <laughs> at it. COVID, COVID's here for a while. Um, you know, it's not, you're looking at Europe, and Europe spiking and peaking again in places, and it goes to show you that you can't contain this, and retreating is not the answer. Because uh, countries have done that. They shut their borders off. Look at Israel. I mean, Israel really tightened up, and Israel's on fire right now. Mm. Um, mm. You know, by, I think by the numbers, they're one of the worst. Now, that's reporting numbers, and you can probably trust Israel's reporting. There's other countries, you know, that have to be crawling in it, um, right. but they just don't have the testing, and they're not being honest with their reporting. And sure. I'm not going to name those countries because we're working a lot of those. But me personally, I don't think it's getting better here in the U.S. as well. But if you look at the number, and again, I'm not a doctor, and there's a lot of people that are going to disagree, but if you look at the numbers of infections and what the World Health Organization is predicting, the death rate is going to be lower than that of the flu. So this is a highly infectious uh, virus compared to maybe the flu, um, and more people are going to get it, but the death rate I don't think is going to be any different. And so with that knowledge, I go back to don't live in fear. Don't be dumb, don't be careless, right. don't be frivolous yeah. with the resources. But as the church and as a country here in the U.S., I hope we lead lead in being bold and going out and serving and loving others and loving our neighbor during this time. Um, don't retreat. And, I, you know, it's coming back from my background, you know, sure. retreat's a dirty word. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> I, never, I never did it. And that's going to carry true for what I'm doing here as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, how many months did you spend with Operation Christmas Child as part of your rotation? I did about eight, I, I did about eight months with them before Dad moved me to Project. So <laughs> I, I got to see, I, I gotta see uh, a buildup of the season, you know, when they're dealing with the local churches here in the U.S. and equipping the volunteers here, and then I got to go out and actually see the distributions happen. Wow, so I got to awesome. see kind of both sides of it. So unbelievable opportunity. Well, let's do history, Edward, because you and I are history buffs, right? That's right. 19... Yeah, I'm a history. Now, I don't think I'm good at it, <laughs> so let's do this. <laughs> 1993, your dad gets a request to send shoeboxes with gifts to kids in war-torn Bosnia. That's right. I did not know that was how Operation Christmas Child got started since that time. But even worse, he forgot about that. So yeah, he I did read that. He had to be reminded, yeah. right? The guy called him again. Yeah, he got forgot about it. I got a phone call. Was like, it was, he was like, oh, boy. But here's the lesson learned, Dad learned from that. You know what bailed him out when he, when he overcommitted well, and forgot he committed? was the church. Uh, uh, church down in Charlotte, uh, um, mm-hmm. Ross Road Church down in Charlotte, mm-hmm. North Carolina. Uh, that's the church that bailed him out. And a couple other churches, Skip Isaac and Greg Laurie's churches, uh, the, the Calvary oh, wow. churches. Went out yeah, there. we know him well. California. And Harvest. They yeah. bailed that out in the next few years and got that going. But that's what Dad realized after a few years of just passing out gifts as toys. You know, Dad realized, no, this is for evangelism. Um, and when they changed that, it just took off. And then Dad realized it's always going to be through the church and partner with the churches. God blessed it. And so that was kind of his lesson learned. Even though he'd forgotten about it, and the church bailed him out. And Dad said, this is the church. This is a tool to go out and, and equip even churches overseas to share the gospel. So it's a, it's a good way for churches here in the U.S. to be connected with the, the church around the world. Wow. And um, wow. But yeah, I think it was 7,000 shoeboxes. I remember Dad, the first truck showed up, uh, or truck showed up from Mary Dameron, a little lady in West Virginia, that sold that on TBN. And she went around the haulers, as she calls them, and collected all the shoeboxes <laughs> and brought them to us. And I helped unload that truck. Wow. But now to come back, you know, I got updates over the years. But to, to think about over a 20-year hiatus that I had between when I was a kid when it started and now, now it's 10.5 million shoeboxes a year. Yeah. Um, 
Well, and let's let's give our listeners a sense for the for the scale. You started with seven thousand. Since that time, oh. more than a hundred and seventy eight million children in over a yeah. hundred and fifty countries have received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. Give us give. I mean, it sounds like you're a logistics guy. Give us a sense <laughs> as to how that massive growth and scale. How did you all pull that off? Well, it goes back to. Bob Pierce, you talked about World Vision before. So World Vision was founded by Bob Pierce. He also founded Samaritan's Purse. Before I came back to Samaritan's Purse, I went back and reread his book. Uh, my dad helped write a book on him. And uh, God, God, uh, God used him in ways, and he always said, let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of the Lord. That's right. And he also yeah. said, plan so big and so bold that it will surely fail if God does not intervene. Mm. Operation Christmas Child is, is exactly that. Um, but the reason it succeeded is God has brought in talent. It goes back to the people that God's brought us. There's a guy named Jim Harrelson who was a banker by trade from South Carolina, but goes off and, uh, and becomes a missionary overseas and worked for us in, in uh, Somalia. He was in Somalia when Black Hawk Down happened and uh, got kicked out of the country, obviously, when things got too bad. So he came back and he was looking for, like, well, we want to go back. You know, We want to do something. And Dad used them and plugged them in with Operation Christmas Child. And through his leadership, and I think that banking side of him, he just understood systems and how to support something. And he he all he believed in the church, and he got the church behind it. And God used that to grow it. But and logistically, it is a beast to get that many shoebox. You know, at first they were uh, going into Bosnia. They they had rent those Antonov cargo planes, those huge, the world's largest cargo planes. Well, you just can't sustain something that big. That's a lot of money. And so then they got into shipping. You know, most of the shoe boxes are sent via ship. Um, but Dad gave another logistical nightmare challenge. Dad looked at him and goes, he has a heart for the Pacific. All these Pacific islands. Dad started flying over them and realized there's no one down there loving on these and uh, sharing the gospel. And the Mormons are. Um, the Mormon church is there. We were there in Tarawa, and they're in there in strength. But who's there sharing the gospel and sharing the truth with them? And so Dad gave him a... a uh, gave our leadership there a challenge. I want a, I want a thousand islands in the next few years <laughs> to get reached with the gospel. Wow, that is a logistical nightmare yeah. to try to get all those boxes out to these little islands. But their team is figuring out. And God, as we go through, I'll, I'll talk about Tarawa. I went to Tarawa. My grandfather fought on Tarawa in World War II. My mom's father. Um, he was a Marine there, Bloody Tarawa, as they call it. Mm. We went there this year to have a shoebox distribution, and we've met a guy. Through a connection of another, some missionaries out of uh, the Marshall Islands. Uh, so here, <laughs> it's how God worked. We went to, we went here here in the U.S. Uh, some of the chicken farms out in Arkansas have a bunch of people from the Marshall Islands working in them because uh, they can in, they can come, they're U.S. citizens of U.S. territory, so they can come here and work. And so we asked the church there, who should we contact with? Well, they gave us the name of a missionary. This missionary gave us in touch of a guy with a shipping business. Who's a believer, a local guy from where? Tarawa. And so as he goes and delivers fuel up on the deck of the ship because of fumes, that's where the, 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 the fuel is stored, yeah. the bottom of the ship is empty. So he puts his shoeboxes in there, and he <laughs> delivers them all over for, for us for free. Unbelievable. Um, Unbelievable. But that's just how God brings people to you. But yeah. that's just one of the examples of a logistical nightmare. But God answered those by either making contacts or people to us yeah. to get the shoeboxes out. So I— I'm encouraged just to see it working, but knowing that these are kids that are hearing the gospel. It's not just toys. This isn't a box of toys. Every distribution has a gospel message that's done in their language that is trained by local volunteers and local churches, and then there's follow-up to these kids that make decisions for Christ through the mm. greatest journey. It's a discipleship program, and I just I love it. And God, oh man, well, I'm so proud to be part of that one. I'm sure you do this, Edward, but I, I mean, I, I saw— uh, just a number of of declarations, let's call them, by people involved with Operation Christmas Child. Whether it was it was the process of you know getting people to donate or or getting the supplies or the people who actually got to go on the on the box drops, if you will, the distributions. Yeah. I mean, it touches people. And, and one of the things I, I'd like for you to, to talk about, if you don't mind, is it seems like you, Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child, would like for everyone in the 
I hate to say supply chain, but but from the box to the child to be positively influenced, the ch- yeah. the church, the giver, the you know the packer, the <laughs> the distributor, yeah. and the child. Like you're you're hoping to affect and influence everybody along the way. That's right. Well, first of all, if you pack a box, we want you to pray over it. I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer, but that box needs to pray about, mm-hmm. needs to be prayed over for the child that's going to receive it. But we partner with churches here because when people pat, not everyone that packs a shoebox is a believer. But when they pass it, we want them to at least be touched or interact with the church and have a, you know, to at least be like, if you have questions or concerns or be prayed over, be prayed over while you're at the church dropping it off. Um, and then as it goes through, even through, so every shoebox has to be inspected to make sure there's not inappropriate items in there or stuff that can't be shipped or imported. And, Cause yep, yep. depending yep. where the shoebox is going, there may be importation uh, challenges. So we have to inspect them. So we have all these volunteers that come to our collection centers and then are, and they go through these shoe boxes and there they're loved on. We have chaplains there. We have chaplains from our, from the Billy Graham association. We have local volunteers and churches there that show up. We want them to, to hear the gospel there um, as well, because, again, not every volunteer is necessary believer. It's a family experience, too, where the families come at Christmas and at Thanksgiving every year and participate. And you see some of the same families coming over and over, and it's a kind of a great tradition for them. But as it goes out, it's the same way with I see churches when I've gone overseas, that it's a family experience for the church that is taking part in the program and going out and doing these distributions. The, right. You know, the mother— yeah might be doing the logistics. The kids are doing the clown show, you know, for the kids. It's, it's all mm. about the family, but at the end of the day, it's all about sharing the gospel. So it's just, it's not packing shoebox and they get shipped and then it gets unpacked and there's a little story and the, no, they're prayed over constantly. We have yeah. people at the, at the distribution center. All their job is to go around and pray over cartons of boxes. Unbelievable. Wow. Mm. So how can people get involved with Operation Christmas Child? This is the easiest one. I, I tell you, <laughs> right now, during, thanks for asking. But during the time of a pandemic, the time is now. Think of a kid. If you're overseas and you're shut down and you don't know why the world is black, but all you know is there's fear going on. Mm. No one else is going out and sharing the gospel in a, in a way. I mean, my grandfather, if he was still alive, he wouldn't be able to do a crusade. He couldn't do it to these stadiums. They're shut down. This is the easiest way. If you want to be a part of evangelism, this really is the easiest way, and the time is now during the pandemic. So you can go to SamaritansFirst.org slash OCC, which stands for Operation Christmas Child, and there's plenty of information there. But it, it is simple as packing a shoebox based off what they have on there and the requirements, what they ask for uh, on how to pack one. You can Now, you've got creative liberty to go pack whatever, kind of what you want to put in there. You just can't put gum or candy in there, things that – you know, my degrade in a shoebox or a hot container somewhere. Um, but they'll, they'll list you through that. Just go to the website, and it will tell you, and it will show you where a drop-off location or a partner church is, and just drop off your church, your shoebox at that church. But if you're going to pack one, I just ask, pray. Pray. Right now, God knows the face of every child that's going to receive a shoebox. He already has that figured out. Pray over that child, mm-hmm. the decision that's going to be made that opportunity that church is going to have to disciple that child. Um, it gives me kind of goosebumps, you think, because I've seen those children's faces. You know, I've seen it. You know what? If you're going to pack one, put a picture of your family in there. If you're so bold, put an put in a, in a email or an address in there to write. I've watched kids write mm. to these couples and, and show you, thank you for the box. That's cool. Um, if the language barrier allows it, I've seen it happen. I've even taken pictures of kids holding up the photo of the family, and I posted on my dad's Instagram or mine, and I've had people respond to it. Wow. Um, that's chilling to know that all of a sudden you're, you packed a shoebox, had no idea where it was going, and it ended up in a little island in the Pacific. Mm. And you get to see that. Mm. And I think that's cool. Very Give cool. us the website again, Edward, if you don't mind. Uh, you go to uh, SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC. OCC. There you go. But it's cool. simple. If you go to SamaritansPurse.org, just drive and you'll find it. it. It'll be all over the website. So you mentioned your your dad has a sounds like he's a big Insta Insta guy. Are there? I, I would imagine our our listeners are really intrigued, Edward, by your story. You know everything you're doing at Samaritan's Purse. Are there places yeah. that they could follow you or find you or read resources from you? Yeah, um, I'm not the biggest guy on Twitter. Just so you know, <laughs> I do do it. I think um, I do think it's an ugly place to be. It really, um, it's a but tough if you're spot. So I'm on it as well, but it's tough. 
Yeah, well, I'm I'm at Edward G. 1911. It's not the easiest, um, but Edward G. 1911. For those gun enthusiasts out there, a 1911 is my favorite pistol. Well, um, so that's why I, I probably just lost half your listeners right there. So I even need another half. Um, but if you want to follow me on Instagram, uh, I'm Edward B. Graham. Edward B. Graham. Okay. Outstanding. Yeah, Bill yeah. named of his bell. I'm named after my grandmother's family, so that's Edward B. Graham. Well, maybe a, a couple things, Edward, bef- before we before we let you go. What? Sitting here today, I mean, you're in a you're in this rotational, you know, position with with Samaritan's Purse and learning about all the the different aspects of it. Do you have a do you have a that big vision or big dream that you said only only God could sort of make it happen for the future of Samaritan's Purse? How do you think or dream about the future of the organization? Yeah. You know, and I appreciate it. No one's kind of asked me that yet, so it's not like I formulated a response. But what I what I would tell you is, again, I came here to be faithful and to help my father. And so my dream is his dream right now. But as I see the ministry and as I look through, you know, I had the desire that no matter where we go, I want to be there first. Um, and I want to be yeah. there with a quality of work that is is replicates that of Christ. And I want to go to the same place as my dad did, the ditches and the gutters of the world, where other people don't go, because that's what the story of the Good Samaritan is all about. That's it. Yep. But the story of the Good Samaritan is not just providing the immediate need, because he did. He provided the immediate need. Um, he provided uh, the care, the housing, but he also told that innkeeper, here's some additional money. I'll be back. If right. you need more, it took more, I'll take care of that too. So how do we take care, take care of the long term? Water and everything, those meet your immediate needs and food. I'm all about the long term, and that's the gospel. So my Mm -hmm. dream and vision, we're going to get there first, and we're going to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. That vision is no different than my father's. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, last thing, if you you don't mind, uh, you know, this has been an incredible conversation of your history and the organization and, and, and... Dan and I and our organization will be praying for Operation Christmas Child and hope it's Thank you. it's at an unprecedented level of activity this year. And it, it just sounds like you all are continuing to to grow and grow and have a huge impact through that through that ministry. Let's go back to the name of the organization, Samaritan's Purse, the name of this podcast, Walking Through Samaria. You even mentioned Twitter's an ugly place, and I would completely agree. Is, is there maybe a little bit of wisdom that you could leave our, our listeners with on how to be a good Samaritan as it was written in Luke chapter 10? Yeah. Um, yeah to me, it's easy. And, I, and I've kind of learned this coming back at um, the guy that runs North American Ministries for us. His name's Luther Harrison. He was a cop for 16 years before he felt called to come help. And he worked his way up from being a, an associate to now a VP. But I, have, I don't watch Luther at a restaurant. When he's traveling to, and responding to these storms or hurricanes, he'll look at that waitress and goes, ma'am, we're about to pray over this meal, but how can I pray for you? Yeah, yeah. It's never passing up a ministry opportunity. And all of our interactions, no matter where, you don't have to be serving in Vietnam. You don't have to be in Mongolia working to, to be an example for Christ and share the hope and the reason is, uh, the hope that's inside you. You can do it right there in your own community. Um, when I was a young kid, Sammy Dagger, a good friend of my dad, who has a church in Beirut, Lebanon, it's the same church we partnered with when we responded to the blast there. Uh, we sent a team there as well, our dart and flu supplies there. He always said, Edward, don't ever send me someone to be a missionary in the field that's not first a bold champion for Christ in their own neighborhood because mm-hmm. uh, they're a coward and I don't want them. And I was, it is, it's true. I went to a Christian school, Liberty. It's easy to be a Christian in a Christian school. Um, it's actually easy to go overseas and share the name of hope with people you don't know, but with your own family and your own streets, are you bold for Christ there? So my encouragement is every word of scripture is true. It's God breathed. I don't understand all of it. Trust by faith that it is and go boldly in your own neighborhood, in your own church, Mm -hmm. be the church, be that hospital in your community and go out there and reach people. That would be my encouragement. That's what I've learned here by other people's example. That's, That's awesome. Good. That That's awesome. That so, Dan, I was at the NRB. You know, NRB is this conference that we yeah. go to, the National Religious Broadcasters Conference, two years ago or three years ago. And our good friend David Stein, if you remember, Ryzenstein on on Victory Radio in okay. the morning. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. 
And he did that, Edward. It was the first time I'd ever seen it happen. So we're about ready to, to say a blessing over the meal. And he grabs our server and says, hey, we're about to pray. Is there anything we can pray for? Two yeah. servers grabbed chairs wow. and sat down with us. And one of them went and grabbed a chef out of the kitchen. And they came over yeah. and sat down and prayed with us. It was one of the most amazing things I had ever seen. And he was just doing what, what you just said, Edward, right? Which is yeah. the, the ministry I in everyday life. Unbelievable. I watched a little girl, one of our, he was my roommate at Liberty. We played soccer together. He works for Operation Christmas Child. His little daughter just did it at the restaurant here with me. Wow. And I smiled as she did it. That that waitress shared that she had lost two children in, in during pregnancy, and they're trying to get pregnant, oh, and we gosh. could pray for that. That's not what I was expecting to hear from this waitress. <laughs> right. So that's what she told this little girl. So we sat there, and we prayed with her on that. And every night, I'm still praying for that that waitress. It was a Cracker Barrel. And um, I just, a little girl did that. And that, that little girl's bold. Why can't we all be that bold? Yeah. Um, it'll move mountains. Yeah, for sure. Whew. Wow. Well, Edward Graham, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your story and your vision and, and your experience. And it comes right through the airwaves, man, that you are really, really passionate about the work that, that you're doing at Samaritan's Purse and the organization as a whole. And I'm really glad that you heeded God's call, the, you know, and, and and, and, (laughs) yeah, that's just awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Well, hey everyone. Yeah, no, Edward, please. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I just, this opportunity, very humble to be on your, on your show today. And thanks for allowing me to just share the story of Samaritan's Purse, what we do and what God's called us to. That's pretty inspiring. Thank you so much. Well, hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in on the Walking Through Samaria podcast. It has been a treat to have Edward Graham, the youngest son of Franklin and Jane Graham and the grandson of Billy and Ruth Graham on our, on our show today. Edward, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We'll talk to you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. For more content like this, visit us at givingcompany.com. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Walking Through Samaria.